Hello and welcome back or welcome if you are just joining us for the first time. Uh, today, this is session two of a four session series um, and the workshop and it, the second, uh, the third and fourth sessions will take place on Friday, 9 April, uh, beginning at 6, uh, 1830 uh, IST time. So we hope you'll come back and join us again for uh, sessions three and four on Friday. But today, um, I'd like to welcome you back to the TSDSI slash TIA workshop on 5G networks, strategies for enabling standards-driven technologies and innovation. This session's topic will be supply chain security, hosted by Mr. Ken Kaufman, who is TIA's chief technology officer and Senior Vice President of TIA Quest Forum, along with Sherrod Aurora, who is the Co-Chair Outreach Committee and Vice Chair Study Group Services and Solutions at TSDSI. Next slide, please. Mr. Kaufman is Senior VP of Standards and Technology, responsible for assuring that all our communities add value for our members and participants. His team oversees the process as well as execution of standards at TIA, in addition to TIA Quest Forum. Ken is a charter member of Quest Forum, an author of both PL9000 handbooks and an acknowledged industry expert. He has served on the board of directors for over 10 years. Next slide, please. Mr. Aurora is a technology evangelist who has expertise in telecom technologies and operator IT and BSS, certification authority technologies and deployment, network and device security, machine to machine communications, embedded systems and IoT information technology for telecom VAS, SIM cards, related infrastructure and security. Now I'd like to welcome Ken Kaufman. Thank you, Becca. And I do want to thank Mr. Subramanian, uh, uh, Pamela, and, and Bindu for the opportunity to, to speak to you all today on an important topic. Uh, it's a topic that many have been talking about. Um, it's, uh, there's a buzz in the industry about how are we going to uh, secure our supply chain. And I think as Mr. Supermanian uh, led us off this morning, he talked about how uh, the pandemic has, has demonstrated how reliant we are on our networks. And this is only going to grow as we deploy our 5G technologies and therefore uh, securing the network as, uh, as we see the, the dramatic expansion of software coming into the network is a critical factor. So um, I'm gonna to wanna to talk to you a little bit about what TIA is doing relative to uh, security and specifically security throughout the supply chain. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully it'll be informative on, on ideas that you might want to pursue um, specifically within India. So uh, before I jump into uh, the overview of our standardization activities, I wanna talk a little bit about our strategic approach. Um, whatever is being done uh, relative to security in the industry, you're seeing it uh, several different standards of different types, uh, examples being like ISO 27001, the information security standard specifically. Uh, you've seen governments get involved. The United States government has been very active uh, Department of Defense has created something called CMMC, which is a uh, security standardization and maturity model. Um, you've seen the Cloud Security Alliance, the, which is looking at all cloud-based elements, creating a standard. You've seen uh, different regions. Uh, we've worked with ANISA for Europe, who has been putting together standards. So there's a wide variety of activity going on. Uh, but what our members came to us and said, while there's, there's some great work that's being done throughout the world, we don't see one comprehensive standard that 
um, we can focus in on. If we want to certify or comply to the 50 plus standards, it will, um, it will be just un unmaintainable. Can you help us identify and create a comprehensive supply chain security standard that we can use to assure that networks can be trusted? Um, so one of the things that we, we started with is we said, we need to, uh, we, we, Quest Forum, uh, which is a division of, of TIA, who's been around for 20 plus years, has written ICT's quality management system called TL9000. And we believe that security is a, is a very important element of quality. You can't have a quality product unless it's secure. And therefore, any, any standard that was going to support security throughout the network needed to have a foundational element of a quality management system. It needed to be a process-based standard. And that's uh, where we started. We also felt that any uh, standard that was going to be effective needed to be certifiable. And that means that an independent third party needs to be uh, able to come in and confirm that your organization has the processes necessary to support uh, continuing security. And then finally, as we've done with TL9000, we felt that any standard that was going to uh, be effective long term needed to have a set of performance measurements for the industry that organizations can benchmark themselves against. And that was our approach to this. Next slide, please. So um, you can see in our problem statement and proposal, there's a few items that, that, that I'll highlight. Um, on the second bullet, you're, you're really seeing with the dramatic deployment of software uh, that organizations are becoming more and more reliant on their supply chain. Uh, you focus on your strategic competencies and you outsource the rest. Now you do due diligence to assure that your uh, supply chain is going to be around for uh, the duration and also has the quality and expectations that, that are aligned with your products. But what we've seen is a dramatic expansion of supply chain. And if you saw have, have watched uh, the most recent breaches that have had very devastating effects, those really were issues within the supply chain. Organizations have done quite a bit to harden their own operations, but we need we are now seeing that the supply chain is a vulnerable area. And you need to assure that your supply chain is taking the similar steps that you are in order to uh, harden and provide security of your products and services. Also, we found that there are existing standards that really have gaps with some of the, the more current issues uh, that, that have been identified. So issues like provenance, where you have traceability of all the components that are going into your products and services. These requirements have not found their way into standards and we needed to address that gap. Similarly, there are, there are a few standards not related to specifically to security, but, but have talked uh, in detail about um, about the, um, the counterfeit parts, specifically the aerospace industry, ISO 90, uh, 9100 has some good information about how can you assure you don't have counterfeit parts integrating into your, uh, into your supply chain. So this is an area that we need to focus on. We also needed to, um, utilize some of the great work that's been done out there relative to controls. ISO 27000 has over 100 controls that they look for users to implement. Uh, the CCM standard has also over 100 controls. Uh, CMMC has a whole significant number of controls. So what we wanted to do was to utilize those controls that made sense. We did find that some of the controls in these standards, while they certainly improve security, have tremendous amounts of cost to implement. And therefore the, the investment to implement doesn't 
provide the value. And so we, we really tried to cherry pick those elements that made sense from all these other standards, highlighting those that are truly necessary throughout the supply chain. And so our view was to create a standard that supports this, that, that utilizes the great work that has been done, brings connectivity to all the existing standards. So we will provide traceability to so says, this is the, these are the pieces out of ISO 27000. These are the pieces out of the quality management system standards. These are the pieces uh, that are, are bringing out uh, counterfeit parts or uh, looking at uh, other areas uh, from, from worldwide input. Uh, this is our proposal. Next slide. Before we started to write, we felt it was critical that we did a landscape review of what's out there. And we've looked at over 50 different existing standards and documents that are being utilized today for hardening security. I know that you can't read this slide, but essentially what it's doing across the top, you'll be able to see this uh, in the handouts, but across the top, you see the different elements that we feel need to be incorporated into the standard. If you look down through the chart, on the left side, you're seeing what are the standards that we looked at. And just to, to give you a flavor, um, of course, we had the quality management system standards, um, ISO um, 9001, TL 9000, which is the ICT version, um, the aerospace version, 9100. Uh, we looked at, at automotives, uh, uh, QMS standards. We also looked at the existing information security standards like 27,001. We looked at um, NIST standards. NIST 800 has a whole series of standards. That's the uh, from the US government uh, on security. We looked at uh, global activities that have come out of Etsy and looked at uh, Anisa's work. We've, we've uh, worked with uh, some of the folks in Japan on some of their, their uh, standards. So for each of those standards, we tried to identify what actually addresses different components that we wanted to incorporate. And if you see a check mark, it means that there is some aspect of that standard that we can utilize. If you see a check minus, it says, and most of those are there, it says it doesn't fully address the area that we need to, uh, we need to incorporate. If you, if you also see a check, it doesn't mean that we should incorporate everything that's in there, because as I said before, there are some elements in many of these things where the investment doesn't outweigh the value. So we definitely want to cherry pick the good work that's done and then fill the gaps with the knowledge and experience that we've had over 20 years of implementing quality across ICT. Next slide. So how did we put this together? Uh, this gives you an idea of the architecture. As I mentioned before, the foundational element of our system is a quality management system. The most widely deployed quality management system is ISO 9001. And so uh, any uh, quality management system sector standard that incorporates ISO 9001 is perfectly valid and uh, as a foundational element. So if you uh, if you certify to our standard, you will also get an ISO 9001 certification as a byproduct. If you have something that incorporates it, like TL 9000, then you are already well along the path to implementing our standard. On top of that core structure, we added, we're adding a whole series of, of supplemental things specific for supply chain security. The first you see that we're, we're uh, considering implementing is a series of trust principles. Now we know governments have been very actively involved in the area of security and have expectations for, uh, for vendors who are providing products and services into the network. And so we've looked at the PROG principles that came from a whole series of, of, uh, of governments coming together to say, what are the principles that are necessary uh, to understand that a, that a vendor can be trusted? We've identified eight principles that we're discussing 
how we might incorporate into our standard. These are things like if an organization has been found uh, to have a judgment against them for unfair business practices, this is something that we should be transparent about. And that's something that we, we are talking about is that it can it be incorporated into our standard it's something that has never been done in standardization before but uh it, it's it's a critical aspect and one that governments and regulatory bodies have have told us is important for them to have an appreciation that the vendor community going into their networks can be trusted so we're having those discussions um nist has been has put forward a document the 800 um, dash 207 that talks about zero trust principles <clears throat> and zero trust architecture is going to be something that's evolving over the next years and with the proliferation of software it's where everyone is going so we are incorporating zero trust principles into the architecture we are also um, defi we've defined six different asset classes and those asset classes will have to have an associated configuration management database. And those requirements are going to be built into our standard. We then said there are, since it's a process-based standard, there are seven specific processes we need to add that are going to be mandatory for anyone certifying to our standard. And they're listed on the left. The vulnerability is critical. So you have to have vulnerability management. You need to have a process for dealing with risk assessment and how you deal with those risks. You need to be able to deal with incidents. You have to have uh, secure development throughout the life cycle and understand what does that mean. We want people to be uh, to understand how they're going to deal with uh, open source and free open source software. And, and finally, it, we must deal with counterfeit parts and assure that you are not integrating counterfeit parts through the supply chain all through the life cycle. That includes maintenance as well as initial design and manufacture, excuse me. Then there's a whole series of supply chain requirements on how do we deal with the supply chain and who's accountable. If you use uh, some products, who is going to be accountable for um, assuring the security on those? We then are adding in a series of controls that come from the controls uh, of these other documents that we talked about that we've reviewed. And then finally, we're defining a set of, pro of performance measurements that will be integrated into a secure repository so that we can publish industry results. They'll be anonymous, so you won't know who has had higher vulnerabilities versus others, who has been more responsive to breaches and so on, but you'll be able to see what is the industry performing at. So internally, you know your performance, you'll be able to drive improvement accordingly. This is the structure, this is how we feel we'll be able to create truly a comprehensive standard that will support security throughout the supply chain. Next slide. Uh, very, this slide is really for reference. We have 10 sub teams that are actively working to provide their inputs for all the things that I just talked about. These sub teams have, as you can see, the, the focus areas for each of their groups. They're currently providing their inputs so that we can assemble an initial draft. And if you could go to the next slide. It, this is really where, um, what we're, we're trying to deliver against. Um, the bottom line is in the fourth quarter, we hope to publish this standard. Uh, we're working, it's a very aggressive time frame, but um, we believe we can meet this, this uh, schedule and we, um, we are working hard to do so. So uh, this month, we're trying to assemble the inputs from all of these sub teams, uh, which will continue after we have the initial draft. Um, we're also working on our certification scheme and training requirements. It's critical that if we have a standard, that the level of rigor used to certify a company is the same in Asia as it is in uh, North America or in Europe. And so we are defining specific requirements for accreditation bodies and certification bodies, as well as a training program that will assure 
that that our auditors have the skills to properly assess the, the requirements and measurements that we're creating. Um, through May, we want to pilot uh, the proposed measurements, making sure that they can and uh, are comparable. We have internal facilities to be able to do that. And uh, our pilot companies will provide that input to make sure that these are uh, not only benchmark, Uh, apologies for this interruption. I think we've lost Mr. Ken Kaufman's connection. Uh, please bear with us. We're trying to get him back online soon. Hey, good evening, everyone. Seems we have a little bit of a communication drop at the Ken's end. So I'm just going to request the organizers to continue the session. Okay. Yes. Let's let's go on, and and hopefully Ken can get his connection back on here soon. Thank you for that. Um, Tourette, let's move into the uh, panel discussion, if you would, as moderator for this session, uh, introduce the panel. Can. Yes, hi. I, uh, of course, things uh, work out this way, right? My computer reboots right in the middle of my discussion. Aww. I hope if it was not terribly disruptive. Uh, I apologize. I was on my last slide, I think, anyway. So I, I hope uh, I hope it wasn't uh, wasn't too difficult to. To move ahead. No, that's fine. Welcome back. Thank so you. it is time though, unless you wanted to wrap up that final slide and then move into the panel. Okay. I think the uh, I think the, the dates speak for themselves and uh, uh, you know we'll happy to have anybody get involved if they're if they're interested. My final slide on there had a uh, contact information as well as an email address that goes to our, to our folks. So, um, you know, by all means, feel free to connect up with us if you have any questions or, or want to get involved. All right, thank you, Ken. And now we'll move on to our panel discussion moderated by Sherette Aurora from TSDSI. Sherette, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Ken, for what seems to me to be an extremely engaging, engaging session. 
I could have listened to that for another hour. <laughs> but uh, time's uh, what it is. And uh, let me check uh, now. I think we have uh, uh, quite a uh, illustrious uh, panel here, other than Ken himself. Uh, may I uh, ask you to slide down and let me check uh, if we have, uh, yes, uh, we have Mr. Narendra, Joint Secretary of National Security Council Secretariat, an office that reports to the Prime Minister's office. Uh, Mr. Narinath is uh, an Indian Telecom Service uh, Officer who works in the position of a Joint Secretary for the National Security Council Secretariat as of this moment. And he handles uh, the coordination in matters of cybersecurity. Uh, he, his office coordinates uh, with uh, government offices uh, like Department of Telecoms, like uh, the Ministry of Information Technology, uh, uh, depends and so on and so forth and uh, he has the responsibility to ensure that uh, matters of national security matters related to technology matters related to telecoms are properly dealt with uh, he has a, of course a very large experience in communications and has handled security as a portfolio in many different parts of it, the experience of the last 30 odd years and then as the next, so Mr. Narendra, thank you very much for joining us today. And I think your time on this panel is going to be of immense value, not just to the audience uh, that listen to this panel, but also in my opinion to TIA, uh, because one of the reasons why we have this uh, uh, panel is for this uh, enormous collaboration that can be underway between the two SDOs and actually between the two countries too. Uh, once again, back to Mr. Narendra. Uh, please can you go on to the next slide. Uh, uh, Satish Jamad Dagni, uh, Vice Chair of TSDSI and uh, Vice President at Reliance Geo, uh, has had a very illustrious career of 23 years, very active in 3GPP, DSMA, ORAN. And uh, I am not so sure that he is uh, already packed in, will be packed in in some time. Till then, if we can go to the next slide. Sitaram Jamarthi, consultant TPS, uh, been working on cybersecurity and research in TPS. Uh, responsibilities between research focus and customer focus both. Uh, what we have here is a little bit of a technology glitch, hard to explain, but uh, basically between the choices that Mr. Chamarthi makes and between the choices that uh, the conference organizers make, there is an unbelievable uh, but factual gap. So Mr. Chamarthi is actually going to be represented by Hindu, who has uh, the honor of uh, most person for Mr. Chamarthi. Welcome, Bindu, and welcome, uh, Mr. Chamarthi. Mr. Chamarthi is actually on the, on the bridge for some reason his trading system will not allow him to uh, become uh, audio visual all right so if we can go to the next please uh, we have mr sushil kumar and on the bridge on the panel uh, mr sushil kumar is uh, literally that person in the indian telecommunication service who has uh, together with uh, another senior colleague of dsdsi uh, advice to Mr. Mittal, set up the industry collaboration to develop technical reports within the apex body called Telecom Engineering Center. For more than seven years now, uh, more than 11 or 12 uh, different uh, reports in many different verticals of Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine communications have been released under his uh, sponsorship, under his mentorship, and uh, he brings... Uh, Tremendous background with 22 years in uh, in direct telecoms as uh, BSNL, and uh, today uh, he is the deputy director general of Internet of Things at the TEC, the Apex uh, Telecom Standardization Body in India. So um, I to come back to the subject. Uh, as I said, uh, Ken made a uh, very very important and. Uh, appropriate introduction to the cause of uh, a standards-based 
security approach, which is uh, not just important to the national security, it is equally important to consumer interest. And of course, uh, very significant, he said something which is, uh, you cannot have a quality product till it is secure. I had earlier heard from Xerox that you cannot have a statement of quality till you have a statement of a customer requirement. And now this is the second one, which says actually quite correctly that actually you cannot have a quality product unless you have it secure. And uh, then uh, what he elaborated and what he illustrated through the presentation was that there is a maze of standards. There are a wide set of requirements. There is a necessity to draw a balance between what is practically possible for the industry to do, what is affordable, and at the same time, have a framework that can be practically utilized for assessment, for certification, and for assuring the consumers, the users, that what they use is what is meant to be used or what it says it is meant to do. So I'm going to start off that conversation today evening. Uh, I will uh, request uh, straight away uh, Mr. Sushil Kumar to express some views on what I believe is the foundational element of security, which is emerging very much to be the uh, most important part, security by design, which is to have the basis of security founded in the approach to developing product solutions, services, and taking them to market. Uh, so, Sushil Ji, would you want to please uh, say a few things about your view on security by design and why the regulator in India finds that so important and what are your views on it? Yeah, uh, uh, good evening and uh, good morning uh, to our friends from uh, USA and North America. Uh, I'm really... Uh, uh, Thankful to TSDSI and TIA for organizing such a wonderful conference and uh, uh, in giving me an opportunity to speak in this. So uh, uh, this uh, security by design, it is a really a very important uh, subject. And uh, uh, as we know, uh, uh, the IoT devices uh, in the telecom infrastructure, uh, it should be uh, secured and uh, uh, the security should be built in uh, at the time of design itself. Generally, it has been seen that uh, the security is set to be the last option for the manufacturers. And once uh, they launch the product, uh, then uh, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, devices and the uh, uh, equipments are not uh, uh, secured. Even the I IoT SF, that is uh, the IoT Security Foundation, they made a survey uh, that on, and found uh, uh, that only the 13 percent, uh, around 13 percent of the IoT manufacturers uh, from North America, Asia, and the Europe, uh, uh, they were having the vulnerability disclosure policy. They were uh, so then uh, uh, they were not aware. Even in India, no such guidelines uh, are available as on date. Uh, therefore, security by design principles it is one of the most important item, and uh, the Indian regulator. Uh, when they released uh, their recommendations in 2017, uh, the, uh, the two recommendations uh, uh, were one, one was uh, on security by design principles for IoT device manufacturers, and uh, the second one was the National Trust Center uh, for the M2M uh, devices and the applications. And uh, the, the, uh, there were a number of recommendations, and these two recommendations were very important from the security point of view. And uh, on both the recommendations, our TEC is working from the last uh, uh, more than one year. And uh, uh, on this, uh, we have released uh, one document on consumer IoT security, and that is based on ETSI uh, 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 103645 uh, uh, standard uh, that is having uh, the principles, basic principles. And the same uh, has been adopted by the European Union, uh, and uh, the, the same principles have been used by Australia as well as uh, the UK. Uh, therefore, uh, this is one of the part uh, which will be used for the national 
a center and uh, for testing the security point of view uh, this uh, mandatory testing and certification of telecom equipment that includes the smart devices uh, the iot devices uh, that uh, this is mtct it is the flagship project that is going on under the ambit of uh, uh, telecom engineering center and the uh, minimum essential requirements have been prepared uh, and uh, uh, this testing is being done in a phased manner uh, for the telecom infrastructure and the uh, iot devices uh, therefore uh, because iot and the telecom is being used to build up the smart infrastructure if the uh, these devices and the telecom infrastructure is not secured then anybody can hack uh, the um, uh, smart infrastructure and uh, may cause uh, a lot of uh, a huge loss to the um, uh, human life at the as well as the uh, the infrastructure therefore it is very important right Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, elaboration, uh, Sushil ji. I also had a comment from uh, Sita Ramji, and I'm going to just request Bindu to read it aloud so that we have two views on this subject of security by design and uh, get uh, his views across to the audience and to the panel. So, Bindu, would you kindly read that aloud? Yeah, thank you, Sharad. So, on behalf of Mr. Sita Ram Chamarti, uh, his response to this concept of security by, by design is um, secure, and I read from his uh, response. Uh, security about 10 years ago was an afterthought, like a bolt on. Luckily, in recent years, people have realized that it is necessary and have started including it early in the life cycle, whether of a software tool or something else. But design is a one time event in that life cycle, and we are now in a world where security needs to be re-examined regularly because what was secure yesterday may not be so today. So in the context of supply chain security, the delta in this aspect can come from some other organization, product, process, down the line, which we, we may not even be aware of. So, Very well. Thank you, Bindu, sure. and thank you, Mr. Chamarti. Ken, yes. Could I uh, just also elaborate on, on that? I believe uh, security by design is critical. We want it to be built in, as, as Mr. Kumar has, has very well stated. It's also important that you do deal with the service side. So security by design applies and you design a service. So uh, as if products like the IoT example that Mr. Kumar mentioned, will have to have some level of updates and services. And just because it's secure when it was initially delivered, it's going to have probably uh, some level of, of uh, flashing of updated features and capabilities, and that's a vulnerability. So as you do these maintenance functions, which is later in the life cycle, it's just as important that those services are implemented with security by design in addition to just the initial design. And that's where I think the comment is very appropriate that security by design applies to the entire life cycle. It doesn't apply just to the initial product design. So. Thank you very much, Ken, for those views because that is exactly what came through in the recommendations of the regulator that there has to be a unique identifier there has to be a mechanism to monitor the security of a device, a connected device and a connected application across the life cycle. There has to be a mechanism to be able to tell what is rogue and what is not. And then uh, there has to be a method for all of this to be made visible to the users, with, which was described as the concept of the National Trust Center. So let me bring that question to Mr. Narinna then, that uh, about four years back uh, or three and a half years back, the Indian telecom regulator saw the need for setting up a national trust center uh, founded on the concept of a uh, root of trust that was tamper resistant, that could be called secure by design. Uh, so what are your views on the approach to having a national trust center and what in your view is uh, necessary in terms of requirements and in terms of certification for that national trust center to be useful 
in achieving the objectives of security, national security, industrial security, consumer security. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, before I come to the question, I would like to, you know, begin myself with the secure by design uh, part of it. Please I'd like to slightly disagree with my colleague from uh, TCS. Okay. In the sense that, you know, that, that secure by design is something that people are doing it on ground. You know? I still feel that secure by design is something that's uh, put out by regulators and by, you know, and people talk about in uh, seminars like this. But on ground, I don't really find that happening. And that is, I, I'm talking from personal experience. And, and personal experience as recent as, uh, you know, the last week. So we have, uh, we were in touch with, you know, for development of a solution for a certain, for a certain product, a certain solution development. You know, very enthusiastically, we received, uh, you know, documents which specified the functional uh, specification of that, what that product would do or what that solution would do. And, uh, you know, we had to specifically ask the team about, you know, the security aspects of it before they really got down to talking about it. And the team that was interacting with us uh, didn't have a clue. And then, you know, they had to go back and, uh, you know, get people along. And then when we asked them uh, difficult, I will not say difficult questions, normal questions about, you know, authentication and uh, identification of people uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, how, how would the different modules uh, uh, interact with each other? You know, what are the different threat scenarios that are there, whether threat analysis has been conducted? Uh, yeah, and whether, uh, you know, uh, uh, risk analysis has been conducted you know it was not there so it was like uh, some sort of a uh, the user uh, actually leading the developer down the path of security and uh, you know after a couple of sessions he was saying you have said that you asked us to do this so we are doing this now i think that was not the right the sort of answer that you would expect you would expect the developer has uh, a complete understanding of what is secure by design and then actually leads the user in telling that this is what you should put it into it depending on the criticality of the uh, solution that you're trying to deploy so i think there's a, a lot of work that's required to be done especially in the secure by design area and uh, somehow i think a manual or something a standard which says that whether the security architecture has been decided or not has to be you know, specified and then ticked off uh, along with the functional architecture being specified. Okay. So, I mean, I'm confirming because TRI has given a recommendation as equivalent design. I don't think anybody is doing anything about it. Okay. And I think that very much is uh, what uh, fascinates me about the work that TI is doing. Uh, that completely unreadable slide that Ken had put up was not because uh, it was his choice. But if you have 50 SDOs and 100 standard, uh, you get that sort of a maze. And that is uh, clearly one of the big questions uh, and also one of the big barriers in, in front of the industry, in front of the developers that you spoke about. Without a usable standard, without that uh, blue book to go to for developing a product or a connected application, it's a really big challenge for the industry to figure what to follow and how to ensure that the requirements of uh, security by design, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, routes of trust, and so on and so forth. It's, it is it's a subject that requires assistance. So brings me back to the question, what in our view would be a good method to collaborate, to find out these uh, basic fundamental requirements that can be simplified into, if I were to just call it, for the purpose of uh, relating to the problems of the industry, if you could give them a 10 page document and say, you meet these, uh, let's just say 50 points, and then you are done. And then, then all your products for now and for life cycle management, over the air management are safe. I, I don't think we have a standard like that. No. Sushilji or uh, Mr. Narendranath or Ken, uh, do you want to pick on that? That actually we don't have that. Yeah, actually, it's like this, you know, as you look at it, most of the solutions uh, that are developed have a 
it's just typical, you know, there is a database that is there, there is some input that's come, that required, you know, some users that are required, there is some data that is required that gets processed somewhere and then is delivered to somebody else and after authentication and authorization. So this is a normal thing. So you should have, I think, uh, you know, uh, reference architecture, reference security architecture, which talks of what are these you know, components that uh, reference security architecture should have. Is I think that should be there. And that uh, is not there. That currently is not there. And yeah. so when you see, uh, when you see, you know, breaches happening and breaches reported, you'll find there's a consistent pattern in uh, those breaches. The same type of breaches, and the same type of vulnerabilities get repeated on and off across the sectors. So it means there is no clear cut understanding. It can, you know, you, it's, it's, it's common. You know, those breaches are there. If you go two years back, you'll find, you know, the list of breaches and the list of vulnerabilities that are there. If you come down two years down the line, you'll find the same things happening. So it means the developers who are there are not properly educated about fixing those things. Very so well. Then, so there uh, is there is experience uh, being collected. I have not been distributed. Yes, Sushilji. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, we we are having a, a lot of discussions in the working. I've gone through the documents released by the European Union uh, uh, Cyber Security Agency Singapore, uh, as well as we have gone through the ITC document and also the NIST documents. Uh, even uh, uh, the uh, simple guidelines um, are not being followed. We don't have even the guidelines being issued uh, uh, for the uh, related with the security. Now, the first time the uh, on I, consumer IoT security guidelines, which were which came in ETSI uh, standard 103645, even even the uh, this uh, UK document mentioned that the people are using the common uh, user ID and password. Uh, mm, uh, in all the devices, even uh, um, then, uh, how, how the things will run? The, then uh, the device uh, devices will become vulnerable if we are having uh, the common user ID password. Uh, then uh, such type of basic uh, mechanisms are not being followed by the manufacturers. Even uh, uh, in one of the uh, conference, uh, people mentioned that uh, the uh, uh, in city surveillance, the cameras uh, ports are found to be open. Uh, CCTV cameras, they are not being tested. Their interfaces are not being tested. Now we are trying to bring the CCTV camera in empty city uh, uh, regime. Then uh, at least we should have some guidelines. We are awaiting that uh, uh, um, NIST, uh, some, some guidelines related to the industrial security may come from the NIST based on, uh, uh, on the regulations, uh, which was released by USA. We, we have not seen any document, Let me any, any document which has been uh, internationally, either on National Trust Center or on the security of the IoT. Uh, complete composite documents which we have not seen so therefore we have to follow the different uh, uh, we have to study and follow the different type of uh, uh, standards let me put let me put ken on the spot for a minute let me put ken on the spot for a minute so ken there is there is a question here which you may answer and also add your comments to it which is security cameras that are being deployed for smart city surveillance have got additional ports open that more than those that should be allowed. Uh, does the TIA standard have some sort of an answer for this? Well, we absolutely talk about uh, opening of ports and that uh, uh, lease privilege is is absolutely one of a uh, set of requirements that are incorporated. I, I'd, I'd like to go back just to this other discussion that we're having exactly this problem where there there are you see manufacturers not following the standards because they're too onerous or because they don't understand that is exactly why we have uh, been asked to create what we're creating uh, and we're doing it in a couple of ways to expect that there will never be a breach is fools uh, it's, it's that's not, it's unrealistic there will be issues. That's why we feel that there needs to, that, that any standard that's to address security needs to be a process-based standard. 
this is not a one-shot deal. It has to be built into the process, built into the quality system that an organization provides. It also must be certified by an independent third party. So, which is which is also what we are, are integrating into our standard. If you don't have those things, then you'll have events. Smart actors are out there who are out trying to breach and, and will continue to try to breach. They're, they're very bright. And so if we try to set a specific set of technical standards and say that is it, it will never continually support us. So the process of uh, QMS requires that you learn from these breaches. That any type of problem that occurs, you go back to the processes that should have caught those and implement improvements so that it will avoid that condition from occurring again. Um, I can't tell you that the ability to certify to our standard is going to be easy. It's definitely not, because in order to provide confidence that the products and services that an organization provides to secure takes some energy and effort and investment. But what we have tried to do is try to make sure that those requirements we're integrating are uh, ones that add value to the organization and um, are not so onerous that the investment will cause them to uh, to just say I can't I can't participate. And then lastly, they will be required to learn from every experience to use the benchmarks that do will be provided as a result to continually improve their quality system. So that, that's my view. I think this problem you're talking about. Um, Mr. Marina wants to come in. I think yeah, the quality management system is a good process. PDC cycle and all of that. It provides you know uh, repeatability and then you know consistency and results. It's good. But the thing is, uh, it should always be backed by uh, solid, uh, you know, technically uh, yes, proper design of this uh, product itself. You know, if you design a product that is uh, not good quality, it will consistently produce a quality, a product of that quality. Of course. You have a system and it ensures that you get a product of a consistent quality. But, you know, the design itself is flawed. The QMS system is not going to help you in this regard. What I'm trying to achieve is you're going to bring in a system of whatever you're talking about based on the QMS 9001. It's going to insist, you know, poor security. The system itself is purely designed. So I'm, what I'm talking is having a, you know, a standard in terms of a security framework, security architecture that people can consistently apply, apply across automation. So that is also required to be done. And you're you thinking... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Saradhi, yeah. you may be aware that uh, um, in the telecom network, when uh, this uh, broadband uh, connections uh, were being uh, installed in the last 10 to 15 years, the whether the uh, um, this telecom service provider, they were providing the admin, admin, user, and ID and password. It's very common uh, in the telecom service provider network in, in India. Even it, it has been mentioned in the UK document, which was released by DCMS that uh, uh, the people are using the admin, admin, user ID password. Uh, so it means uh, it, it's a common uh, thing the people are uh, no, 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 uh, The process-based approach that is talking care of, what's talking about will take care of this. Yeah. Yes. Because yeah. the process- yeah. Yeah. Sir, process sir, for the guidelines are required. Yeah, I, I, uh, the draft guidelines which we have issued, they are required to be released for that. Yeah, we have a couple of questions. In the in the questions, I, I definitely want to be able to get to those. I think it's a very um, engaging conversation we've got going here. But we do have some questions, if you don't mind, that that we ask those yes, so we don't run out of time. Please, Rebecca, uh, please bring in the okay. questions. Please bring in Thank the questions. Uh, the first question is: Could you please tell us what are those institutes, like standard bodies, that make standards in security point of view in India? and how a beginner slash student can participate and contribute in making of these standards, of this standard. Okay, so okay. they want okay. to know, yeah. What... I, I, I would like to pick up the question and readily distribute yeah. it for a one minute to Mr. Narendra Nath and for a one minute to Mr. Sushil Kumar. The question, if it was not read clearly is, someone on the audience asked, where are those institutes where the security standards are being written and how can one contribute to uh, further them? So, 
Mr. Narendranath, you'd like to pick up that one? Yeah. See, uh, one is, uh, I'll tell you what, because uh, let's say, you know, we have got this National Center for Communication Security that actually is looking at, uh, Mr. Shushil Kumar talked about the MTCT, mandatory testing and uh, certification of telecommunication equipment. Under that, the preparation of security essential requirements has been done by the Institute at uh, Bangalore, the NCCS. And that goes through, a, you know, that is uh, the sacred requirements for telecom network elements. So they prepare a draft, then they have an industry consultation and a couple of rounds of industry consultation before that uh, security requirements are uh, finalized. So that is one institution that is doing it. Uh, but uh, at the system level, uh, you know, at the system level, is somebody working on that? Uh, currently, yes, I don't, I, I don't, I, I, there's no, you need to answer my, in the mind organization working at the system level I, I i do want to just quickly say that uh, uh, there is one person to the to the to the gentleman or lady in the audience that's asked the question uh, uh, the mr sushil kumar's mtcte mandatory testing and certification initiatives within tec has more than 50 more than 50 work groups of different type of devices that are asking questions on security and certification maybe sushil kumar do you want to say a few words yeah, um, uh, even uh, Amala, this is uh, basically the essential requirements have been prepared for more than 40 uh, uh, products and it's uh, if we include the variants of those products, it will be more than 100. Uh, so uh, this uh, essential requirements have been prepared and uh, as mentioned uh, by our um, friends, Mr. Narendranath, uh, that uh, the security uh, standards are being written by, by uh, the DOT uh, um, uh, security center uh, that is in Bangalore, and uh, uh, the uh, that will be incorporated in uh, the MTCT, and uh, 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 this uh, safety uh, 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 safety the testing of uh, the technical parameters, IPv6, and others uh, 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 essential requirements they have already been written, and once the security requirements come, that will also be incorporated in it. Okay, thank so you. I just, I just supplement uh, quickly for 10 seconds. You know, we recognize that uh, reference architecture security code in the critical sector, for example, critical information infrastructure, uh, which is important. So, we have uh, RD funding we are giving to an organization, uh, to a set of organizations, including IIT Bombay, uh, for coming up with a security reference architecture for the critical information infrastructure, uh, which we will try to deploy into. And then, after that, after that we will, uh, you know, Build across the other sectors. Recognize that's a deficiency in this area. Thank you. I, I would just also like to quickly add that there is also the Bureau of Indian Standards LITD 28, which is a panel that works on ICT and IoT security. Uh, can you have a quick one to add before I hand back to Rebecca? She might have an additional question, one or two. Well, I, I can't speak to the Indian uh, SDO activity, but certainly our focus is, uh, is to create a, a international standard that could be utilized worldwide and applicable worldwide for uh, ICT products and services. Uh, if any look at their interest in getting involved, we're happy to support it. We also work with the University of Texas directly in our activities uh, uh, supporting our, our involvement. So we, we really do feel that getting students involved who are involved with the latest uh, and greatest technological activities is an important aspect. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bindu, you have something for Mr. Chamarthi? Uh, yes, not for Mr. Chamarthi, but uh, in my hat as TSTSI, uh, we have started some work on cybersecurity in TSTSI uh, in the services and solutions uh, group. And we would very much welcome uh, experts to uh, join up with us, engage with us, on taking this forward. We have published one or two reports also on DNS yeah. security and some work is going on even at the roadmap level. So uh, okay. welcome uh, we welcome uh, folks to join us, uh, join with us um, in TSTSI for this activity. Thank you for Thank taking you. away my thunder for the last one, but welcome to <laughs> repeat it again at the end. That TSDSI has you, got an excellent uh, one more, uh, one question. Yes. Uh, yes, and one more, and I think uh, we, will uh, be able to cover this. Uh, this is directed at Ken. Ken, thank you for your talk. You mentioned about the need to assess vulnerability of supply chains as per processes. 
Would you recommend any process, for example, ENISA, the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, assesses vulnerabilities of core networks components using the ISO 27005 standard as process? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we work with the uh, these folks uh, have been really focusing on IoT security, and they've used the twenty seven thousand series as input. We've we've looked at that. We supported actually their their uh, IoT security process review, uh, providing feedback to it. Um, I can only tell you that you know, if you go back to the the chart that no one can read. Um, it is, there are several standards dealing with supply chain and what we've tried to do with supply chain is look at those standards and try to utilize components that then can be uh, focused in on secure de design development, secure uh, support, manufacturing development and so on. So I think 27,000 has a good base, uh, it does. But uh, that, like I said, 27,000 family, I should say. But uh, definitely the uh, uh, Cloud Security Alliance CCM documents are very good and comprehensive. And they actually have, uh, they've done a nice job on uh, linking their requirements and, and controls to other standards as well, just as we're, we're doing with our work. So uh, both of those are, are good. So look at the 27,000 family. Also look at CPM. We just came out with a new version 4.0, um, and you can find that on the Cloud Security Alliance uh, websites. Perfect. Well, that concludes the question and answer portion, and I'd like to turn it over to Ken Kaufman and Charette to close uh, the, the session for today. Um, well, I'll say a couple of words and then let uh, Sherrod close this out. Uh, obviously, this is uh, there's no energy in this topic, right? Uh, as as you can see from from my colleagues here, uh, it, it's, it's something that that folks understand the importance of, know there's a weakness, and we know we have to fix it. How we do that is is really um, a focus of all of our energy. So we need to find a way to collaborate, work together in order to be able to solve this problem. Because it, if we don't solve this problem, um, it will be, uh, you know, a major, major issue to our networks, to uh, the end users, which Sherrod mentioned initially. So, uh, you know, I encourage further dialogue amongst all of us. I'm happy to uh, work together with you on, on the work we're doing. And I would just want us to thank all of those who participated, both those that are listening, as well as the colleagues here. So, Rod. Thank you, Ken. I, I'd just like to take a minute. Uh, we are just at the stroke of nine o'clock. We're closing now. Uh, first, thank uh, uh, the chair at uh, PSBSI and the CEO of TIA for having taken the time and uh, got this whole thing going. Uh, also thank the uh, DG of TPSI. Uh, very much thank the panel uh, here. Because uh, I think these dialogues are going to promote more and more this understanding that work going on in North America, work going on in India, work going on in other parts of the world needs to be coordinated. We need to find ways to collaborate, bring the best as soon as possible to the industry and then make it happen in a manner that it is practical and affordable. So with that, I would uh, hand it back to Rebecca, hoping that uh, we will uh, bring back uh, more collaboration and coordination. In time to come. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Sharad. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, panelists. Uh, very engaging session today. I want to remind all the attendees that there are five handouts in the handouts tab. If you see those there, you can download those at your convenience. And then we'll also, this was day one of a two-day series uh, for this uh, workshop. So the next uh, sessions will be on Friday at 9 April. And we'll begin at 1830 ISD.
with uh, session three, which will be service performance reliability requirements from next gen networks for connected vehicles. And following a short break after that session, we'll go into the fourth and final session of inoperability for mobile public safety network. So we hope you'll come back and join us uh, for the remainder of the workshop. And until then, thank you all again and have a good evening, the rest of your day. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bye -bye. Mr. Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Sushant. Thank you, Mr. Sushant. Thank you, Mr. Sushant. Thank you all.